You're listening to Two Guys Talking Wine with Michael Pincus and Andre Pru. Hello, Michael. Andre, this is quite the room. It is. We are... <laughs> we've taken the show on the road again. Uh, we are in a quality inn by the uh, by the airport. Yeah, that's where we are. <laughs> and um, and you're you're drinking already. I am. So uh, we. Well, ha- I'm really I'm really excited. Okay. Um, I think it's something that you and I we we both get really excited about wine travel. Yes. Like like we really yes. love the uh, the press trips that we've been privileged to go on, and um, you know, you and I have never had a chance to travel together. Which is a, the, a damn it's shame. It's on the bucket list, and I, I hope know. that happens sooner rather than later. But um, you and I, whenever we come back from the trip, we're always really excited to share like what we found. Uh, I mean, you and, and I... We, and who we found. Well, and, this, you, and you and I, we talk a lot of crap uh, about each other, about wine travel. But and, and this is a piece of advice. We've said it on the podcast a few times, and I cannot emphasize this enough because the number of people I talk to that have experienced this knows that it's true. First off, wine always tastes better in the presence of the winemaker. It does. Yep. And we're about to taste with a winemaker, so this wine should taste pretty damn good. Yep. But secondly, when you travel, if you buy a bottle of wine to bring home with you, you need to enjoy it. I think your exact words were this, and I still don't know how it works, but it works. You need to enjoy the wine twice as much as you think you're enjoying it. Yes. Because when you get home, it's not going to taste quite the same. No. And that's always really held true, because there have been some trips I've gone on where I've brought back like dozens of bottles of wine with your stupid voice in my head and never been disappointed. And there's other times I've only come back with three bottles of wine just because I haven't found those wines that like really make me excited. The winemaker we have in front of us is one of these people that when you came back, you were just like, I tasted all these wines in the Loire. And when they're looking for Cabernet Franc, so go back and listen to the Cabernet Franc episode, which just dropped on November 14th. And um, you were just, you were like, man, I tasted these wines and he's coming to Toronto yes. and we've got to get him on the podcast. Correct. And uh, I was I was thrilled to taste his wines. Uh, we were in uh, Bourgueil. We were at uh, we did a tasting first, and then we uh, we sat down to lunch. And uh, I was so excited to uh, to ta- to have his wines, and and I was so I so loved his wines that uh, I sat next to him at lunch too. So uh, <laughs> this is a, this is like the third time I've sat next to him. Uh, this is uh, Xavier Amero yeah. uh, from Bourgueil. And uh, he is here. To, did I do it all right? Andre was the French good enough. Mais son accent c'est pas mal. C'est très bien. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. Um, so uh, Xavier, uh, tell us a little bit about your winery, and then we'll dive right into what we are tasting now, which is not from your winery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm so glad to meet you again here, Michael. It was thank a you. pleasure. I appreciate. Well, my winery is uh, located in Saint Nicolas de Bourgueil, which is a tiny town, village, I will say. It's, uh, mm, you know, 1,000, 1,000 people living there. Uh, it used to be a Bourgueil big area before revolution, and uh, this village is pretty young. It has less than 200 years old. Uh, it was created just after um, the, Re- the French Revolution. And uh, the Clos des Carterons uh, uh, is uh, uh, downtown the village. Uh, it's, it was it used to be the the, the first uh, city hall and, and school. And my grand grandpa from six generation uh, took it over uh, early uh, eighteen hundred. I think it was uh, eighteen thirty three. And uh, since then, I'm the sixth generation of of winemaker. Um, we do uh, we are producing Cabernet Franc. Obviously, and but uh, not only, uh, we have 36 hectares, which is an average size of a winery for Loire Valley. But next door village moved to Anjou, which is the other province, three, oh. three kilometers away. And thanks to that, uh, my grand grandma, Armantine, uh, three generations ago, uh, uh, brought the white side, the Chenin Blanc, to our winery. Oh, okay. This is why we do also some Chenin Blanc uh, en joue and uh, uh, some Crémant de Loire and uh, Pétillant Naturel as well. But the main uh, varietals we are producing for 80% is Cap Franc. Uh, the, the, the total estate is uh, organic, certified since more than 12 years, and biodynamic Demeter certified as well. Uh, we are uh, close to 20 people full-time working the vineyard and 
the winery and everywhere. So it's uh, this uh, type of farming asks for lots of uh, men and especially women power because we have more women than men in our winery. Hmm. And not only in the office, you know, uh, at the vineyard. And uh, my, my cellar master is a, is a Spanish girl, Anna. Okay. And uh, th- so we have a great team. And, um, you know, well, maybe we're going to talk a little bit later on. But uh, I think... Oh, we'll we have a bunch of questions. We have all kinds of questions. Yeah. But, but first, we're going so we to... We, yeah. we hit you with a curveball to start off. Yes. So we, what we did was um, I talked to Andre uh, this morning. And I said, I'm bringing a current uh, bottle of uh, Cabernet Franc. And I said, I was planning on bringing a bottle of Cabernet Franc, too. And uh, it turns out Andre, the man who does not like older wine, has brought an older Cabernet Franc along with him. So we'll, we'll start with the Ontario older version of Cabernet Franc. It's a 2011. We wanted to get your opinion on this version of Cabernet Franc, and then we'll dive right into the glass with your wines as well. But... This is a 12-year-old Cabernet Franc from a lackluster vintage, the 2011. Yeah, yeah 2011 was uh, cool and rainy, so it was a challenge to get things super right, but it's clear that the people who made this wine... Um, well, let's, let's find what, uh, what Xavier... Yeah, so Xavier, Xavier, what do you think of this? Xavier, wine? what do you think of this version of Cabernet Franc? Well, this version of Cabernet Franc, I can recognize easily the Cap Franc uh, uh, um, characteristic. Uh, for us... 2011 was a beautiful vintage, was hot and, you know, good vintage, very nice weather and maybe a little bit bodier. But here, uh, 12 years old Cap Franc, I think everything is here and it tastes nice. And obviously it gets some, you know, hedge on the nose and testing. And uh, most people maybe not a bit to that. I'm happy to that. I love old Cap Franc because it could edge very nicely. And we can feel a beautiful uh, acidity, which make it possible to carry on for many years. I'm not sure if it's going, can go more power, holder, but uh, for me, I'm used to drink those Cap Franc, and I love to drink them uh, that way because uh, uh, we get, <coughs> huh, it's, not, it's not easy to explain in English, but... Uh, um, you know, the côté, um, the, um, uh, uh, le côté un peu cire, tu sais, en caustique, qu'on, y, qu'on a sur les, uh, qu'on met sur les meubles. Tu sais, tu mets un, sa base de miel, tu mets ça sur les meubles. You put them on, a, on put honey, honey on. Honey, yeah. The type of sweetness in the nose. Okay. Uh, it's honey and uh, you put on the wood and you're on the, on the furniture. My grandma oh. used to do that. And when you get in. Oh, like a resin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Type of resin, you're right. And, when you get into uh, your grandma place, they smell your grandma, you know, type of uh, cooking, obviously. But when she, she clean up the, the place, they smell the encaustic. We call it encaustic in French. It's a base to honey. Oh, my God. And, and it smells that type of sweetness in the nose. And I love that a lot. Man, I, I think you missed your calling as a wine writer. That was like a really lovely tasting note. And I, I think it's something Michael and I, like, it's, it's always hard you know, when certain wines just taste the way they're supposed to. Like, when you taste Merlot, if you don't write cherry in your tasting note, either the winemaker screwed up on making it, or you screwed up as a writer. Merlot smells and tastes like cherries, but when you can get that, like, really visceral response, and you've had a visceral response to that, I always really appreciate that and love that, so thank you for for sharing that. Yeah. Let's dive in. Okay, so the wine was a 2011 bench trial testimony made by Adam Kern and Chris Fornassier, short-lived, uh, project i always thought these wines were um better than i think they got credit for because not a lot of people knew about them and um you were worried that this was going to be over the hill i think you actually told me why am i bringing a crappy bottle of cabernet franc well 2011 i was like uh, that's not the greatest of vintages to uh to show off uh i think there's a little bit of a vegetative note on that one but it's not bad i didn't find anything vegetal did you find anything vegetal no not really but I think you've just got it in your head about these wines. I'm, I'm sticking by my thing. Okay, Michael. All uh, right. So, so let's that... get let's get to Xavier. Let's get to your wines here. Yeah. Um, first question I I have to ask you is um, how long has your winery been making uh, Petillon Naturel? Well, we do Petillon Naturel now since uh, I would say ten years. Okay, because we're, you know, the the main things for us is Cremant de Loire, obviously. But uh, ten years ago, we start to do uh, Petillon Naturel. And that's fun. It's very different than the classic uh, uh, sparkling wine you can get in uh, in Loire Valley. 
Uh, the, uh, this one we are testing now is a 100% Cap Franc Rosé Pétillon Naturel. Uh, do you want to explain the, the process, the difference between Pétillon Naturel and Crémant? Uh, you know, I, I think most of the people listening to this would know. You know? Like Pétillon Naturel is... is um Primary fermentation is, is Petion natural. Would that be the same as ancestral? Like what it's they... exactly that. Okay, yeah. So, so you know, the the main thing is uh, we cannot, uh, you know, we're not controlling it. You 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 have to trust your fruits. You have to trust your must. And when you launch the fermentation with a uh, indigenous uh, yeast, uh, this one is a natural wine. It has nothing added, uh, no uh, no sulfite, nothing. And but you never know what you're going to have. And sometimes it go to dry as this one, but sometimes you can have some sugar left because the yeast uh, decide to stop at one point and uh, you have to appreciate like that. So from a vintage to another vintage, sometimes you get some residual sugar, sometimes not. So I didn't notice a vintage date on this, uh, Xavier. Is there, uh, is there one or do you just know what vintage it is? Well, we don't put the vintage. We could because it's 100% the same vintage. Uh, this one is uh, 2021, I think. Uh, what we do usually is we k- try to keep it on fa- on lees, okay, on the bottles, as long as we like, but not too long to compare to a classic champagne method or traditional method where we try to refine. Uh, the the pétillon naturel, usually you want to bite the fruit. You're not totally in a wine world. You 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 bite the fruit, and 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 if you wait too much, uh, too long, you're going to miss the freshness of the right fruits we love. And uh, so this is, uh, I would say, um, you know, maybe 12, uh, 12 months on fine leaves. And then this one was disgorged. Sometimes it's not, but I like to disgorge it because uh, I don't like to invest my last glass, and especially in restaurants, uh, you know, uh, you Sorry, know, can, can you can you repeat that last line just one more time for the winemakers in Niagara who are making pet nuts still? You like to disgorge your wine. Why do you like to disgorge the wine? Well, ju- disgorge just to uh, get get out from the the de- the, um, the deposit from the yes. the fermentation. Yes, I was I was going to ask you about that because I was not noticing any weird sediment in in the wine, and that is always one of my my big problems. I have two big problems with with pet net. And I've I've discussed them with Andre uh, uh, a few well, times. You said it on this podcast before, and it, and it's the one thing I'm in agreement with you on is you you pay for a full bottle, but you only get to drink two yeah, thirds of two it. Two thirds of it because oh, it's right. either got sludge in the bottom, or it's hit your ceiling, or it's you know it's painting the ceiling because it's got all kind of, you know you, it, it explodes, and you know you get it all over the deck, you get it all over the ceiling, and, and if you get a two thirds of a bottle or half a bottle, and they're usually fairly expensive, especially on this side of the, yeah. um, so. Uh, one, I was happy that we didn't paint the ceiling uh, here, <laughs> and two, I was looking at it, going, "How is this pet net?" And you, you, uh, you disgorge it. So do you do you put a dosage in as well, or no? Uh, no, no, that wouldn't not be not at all. Okay, no. when you disgorge it, uh, obviously you lose a little bit of uh, wine, obviously, yeah. and we refill it with another bottle, just and put the cock, the cork okay. back. If not the cork, uh, the cap. Okay, we keep the cap and. Uh, no sulfite, nothing at all. And and then after a couple of months after, ready to go to the trade, to restaurant, to private customer, ready to drink like that, fresh and clean. Huh. Well, I'm glad it was. Yeah, this is, yeah. this is fresh and clean. Uh, this is fresh and clean. And um, like just a nice torrent of like beautiful red fruit. Um, I know I kind of crapped on like the whole concept of cherry, but like really like cherry, raspberry. Uh, like maybe just a whisper of the savory note that you get from Cabernet savory Franc. kind of rhubarbish kind of note to this. Yeah. Oh, good too. call. Well, yeah. good I agree call. with you, Mike. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. with you on that too. And I don't know if you notice, but absolutely no dosage and it is totally dry. It is. But when you what? taste it, it doesn't make you, your palate totally dry. Oh, I thought it's for sure there was a bit of sugar in that. It is not. not wow. Oh, I didn't get that. There's the, a little bitterness to the finish. That's where the rhubarb comes in, yeah. I thought. Well, the, the, the bitterness is a characteristic of the Cap Franc. Okay. You get that on the red, but it's a beautiful bitterness. You know, it's a character. Cap Franc has a strong character. You know what? I, I didn't find bitterness, but I think it's because I was drinking orange wine in Prince Edward County this weekend. And oh. by comparison, there was no bitter notes to uh bitter notes to your pet now that's a i i, I would drink the 
drink the crop out of that. That's a really lovely wine. That is a that is a very interesting pet net and and something that as as we're not used to seeing, which is clear pet net. So I I can't stress that enough. We've got the next wine in front of us. It's a uh, Chenin Blanc. It's you know it's really fun watching you try to read wine labels with your reading glass. <laughs> oh, it, it, I'm telling you, my, my eyes are getting worse and all the time. And uh, yeah, this is a big wine. Like. The, the texture is insane. Like it's nice and like waxy, and like it just kind of coats the middle of your palate and just fills your mouth with like the white flower and honey, and it's layered over top of like really sweet citrus. Like, do you have? I can't remember. Do you have creamsicles in France? Excuse me. Can you repeat? Creamsicle. Creamsicle. It's a it's a po- it's a popsicle like a like a frozen orange juice. Yeah. With like ice cream in the middle. Juvenile. So oh, yeah, no, the I'm vanilla not ice sure. cream. Yeah, he's looking at you like you're. This, this is like a, this is like a liquid creamsicle. <laughs> okay, okay. It's it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Okay. Oh my god, good. Thank you. <laughs> he's got, <laughs> yeah, I'm all worried. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's a 22, uh, 20, 2022 vintage. It's a, was a global warming type of vintage, so we get a little bit body than usual. But the good thing is we have also the acidity up and enough acidity to keep it balanced and fresh. So altogether, uh, you know, obviously he has a good body. Is uh, We can recognize the Chenin Blanc. It's 100% Chenin Blanc. That fresh white flower aroma. And when you take in your palate, it's you don't have on this vintage uh, the, the green apple as we have usually. It goes straight to more pear and peach, you know, yep. more mature fruits, uh, well-ripe fruits, and uh, it's really enjoyable. Uh, again, uh, this uh, this wine has no sugar residual at all, but because it's, uh, uh, we, we hedge it on the fine glaze, it gets some uh, body, some fat from the fine glaze edging on, in a concrete vat, and this wine is uh, uh, organic, biodynamic, and also uh, Vin Method Nature. That means uh, the new uh, the new certification can uh, explain to the customer is uh, made with uh, organic wine, certified and unpicked, uh, crushed uh, with a certain uh, pressure on it, and we don't add in it in uh, no sulfite at all in the process. No filtration. Also, that means. That means no filtration in the wine to keep the wine very bright and clear. That means it's important to be patient, to rack it every you know every month to just clean uh, to to have a clear wine. So that is how this made this wine. It's very um, so so okay. One thing that you just said, I just want to clarify: yeah. is there actually a designation for vin de nature, yeah. and is it set by the 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 AO, the AOC and there are rules you have to follow or like how are you organized because that's always been an issue that I have is we have natural wine bars in Toronto yeah. and you know it's it's basically at the discretion of the sommelier it's at the discretion of the agent where they say oh this is a natural wine like mm. I don't think there's a set rules for it and you're telling me are there set rules and who made the rules well now now it's done since tw- the vintage of 2019. Uh, uh, 15 uh, winery, 15, 50 winemakers. I will be part of the first, uh, the first uh, part. Uh, 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 Spanish, Italian, and French uh, decide to write a chart uh, about what is natural wine, and they got approved from the governmental, from each one, and Bruxelles, which is a European, approved it. We got the, obviously the AOC system approved it, the process. And also, I don't know how to call that uh, type of, um, um, we call it, um, um, you know, the, the, to make sure the, the health, the people, the customer know we, you, you cannot cheat the customer. The, the special uh, organi- um, uh, administration we have on each country, uh, les fraudes, you know. If you gotcha. advertise for something that is wrong, you can get, you know, uh, punished I mean, for seemed- that. But- and, and, and the, the good thing about that, so today, the only uh, um, certification of natural wine is Vin Method Nature, this one, recognized in all Europe, and now is recognized in Canada, in the U.S. as well, 
the Food and Drug Administration recognized this uh, um, this uh, certification. I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, Ontario winemakers can use that if it, if he, he respect the chart, he can use that uh, certification. And that came up in 2019 because, as you said, uh, most of most of the we got good and bad experience. Yeah, uh, people said, "Oh, that's my natural wine," but the natural wine definition for some were different from yeah, no, others. Very, very different. And sometimes people forgot to say about <laughs> not very good things about natural wine how it's made. This chapter is clear. You can you go online. Okay, he said. The wine has to be at minimum organic. Biodynamic is better, but at minimum organic. It has to be unpicked. Okay? Nothing, no chemical, no chemical adding. So, Indonesian yeast, no sulfite, no filtration, no uh, physical action on it. Uh, um, that's it. So, you, you know, the winemakers have beautiful grapes, healthy grapes. And it's here to bring it to the wine without nothing else. No physical, no chemical. It's, you know, the dream. Can we do that every year? I don't know. So far, since 2019, we did it. Up to 2023. Four years on a row, we did it. But maybe next year, it's going to be a complicated vintage, maybe as a 2011 in a, Listen, but I lo- but I lo- here's my favorite thing about what you're saying, though, as a winemaker, is like maybe not every year, depending on the on the vintage. I think that's the most important thing about winemaking. I think the goal for most great winemakers is to do as little as possible to get a high quality product to the bottle. But at the same time, you have to think about your customers. And if you have a year where it rains nonstop from July until September, you need to think about the twenty people who are working for you, whether your crop yields are going yeah. to make it and whether you're going to have a good product to put so in the bottle. In, so. in, a, in a case like that, what would you do? Would you just well, let it go or drop rules, it? Ooh, good question. Yeah, believe me, the rules of Vameta Nature is very strict. If one vintage, we cannot make it that label, Ferme des Fontaines, Anjou Blanc 2022, we cannot make it, for instance, in 2024. We cannot use this label for five years. Wow. wow. And why that? Because the, the fraud, the, the, the administration said, we don't want to get habit to the customer said, oh, I know this wine, this label, it's a, it's a natural wine. And one vintage after doesn't have the well, process sort of, of that. Like it, yep. and, and they don't, they cannot get it because there's no certification. So, that means we cannot use this label for five years to make sure the customer don't get uh, 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 wrong, you know, get the right wine. Wow. So it's so strict. This but, is but, why. It, but, but it's just a designation of vin de nature. It's yeah. like if you had to make a decision to spray with some antifungals to, to deal with, you know, a crappy rainfall, we might not see a Ferme des Fontaines disappear from your lineup. It just won't say vin de nature on the bottle, right? No. The label will disappear. No, the, the label fr- will disappear. The, the label will is gone. disappear. For instance, but, but you can use wow. the grapes. You can use the grapes elsewhere. Correct. You can. You can. You. You can't make this Ferme de Fontaine label, but you can make something else with those oh, grapes. Oh yeah, sure. Yes. I, w- I will okay. make. Oh, yeah, no. Obviously, yeah. I'm not going to dump. <laughs> to dump my. No, 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 no. No worry. But we'll say I will make a Cabernet Franc, Saint Nicolas Bourguet, for instance, yes. or, uh, with another label. Say it, it's organic. But it's not vin mature, not uh, certified, and like that, the customer, uh, you know, don't get, uh, tr- um, I don't know, um, don't get confused. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, don't get confused. So yeah. this is tasty. So let's let's move on. So we, we we did the Chenin Blanc, and now it's time to to get into some Cabernet Franc, which yeah. I think is the is the crux of I think of this uh, of this podcast, or we were hoping it was going to be. No, this anyway. is the crux of the podcast. So uh, twenty two minutes in, what? <laughs> What makes uh, the Loire Valley the place for Cabernet Franc? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Perfect. All I, right. I, I well, uh, you can close this podcast down, Andre. We're done. You I love know, that, though. It just no. The, 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 the no. Well, sincerely, we you know, sincerely, uh, Cap Franc is around since ever. 
Uh, there are different story explaining how Cap Franc get into the Loire Valley. Uh, uh, we some some says it come from southwest of France before to come from you know uh, uh, from Mediterranean area. I think is uh, you know we have Cap Franc seems to be uh, at least one thousand year mm-hmm. ago, and uh, Cap Franc is here because I guess far before. The AOC, the AOP, the appellation system, uh, the people already noticed that Cap- Cabernet Franc were performing very well, better than the Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot. Uh, uh, well, weather is changing now, obviously, but Cap Franc is performing very well. So, you know, and the appellation system locked it, saying if you do a Red Loire appellation, you have to use Cap Franc, no other varietals. So that's it. It's the rules, and we love it like that. So we have to, and, and it's not complicated. We have to work with it. And, and, and the Cap Franc, I think, is getting better and better, our Red Loire wine. Why? Well, because we're getting more techniques and more experience and more, and the customer is ready to pay a little bit more to give us, us winemakers, more time to uh, uh, write the red fruits and, and to make a, uh, a long, uh, a pretty long aging on the wine to be ready to drink. So today, Cap Franc, and since 20 years now, is very, very popular in France and especially Paris. And my little town, Saint Nicolas de Bourgueil, with 1,000 people, we are, um, we are, I think, 65 million people in France. Anywhere I go in France, in south of France, in the French River, in Marseille, or anywhere, I said, oh, oh, you're from San Nicola, the wine. I'm just one of the 1,000 people. It's totally well known. If you go in Paris, for sure, in a restaurant, you're going to have Cap Franc, four or five Cap Franc to choose, and for sure, at least one San Nicola de Bourgueil, which is at the export in North America, not the case, not no, yet, no. but it's growing. It's coming. We're still waiting for Cabernet Franc to have its day in Ontario. Well, I, I like. I mean, the thing that, and, I, and I'm, I'm just going to gloss over this quickly because we, we did a, 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 a an unwrap or a, a tear down of my, of my trip. Yeah. And, and, and the two places that I found that, that really got Cabernet Franc right, as far as I was concerned, was Saumur and all its little, little plus Saumur puis Notre Dame and all the little Champagny and all. Yeah. And, and Bourgueil and Saint Nicolas de Bourgueil. The um those were my two favorite places to go. The, the 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 Cabernet Franc was ripe. It was it was what I expected Cabernet Franc to be, based on what we can do here in Ontario as well. Um, whereas Chinon, uh, I found was st- they still were in that green pepper, bell pepper. Salad phase. Do you know, mm. I, I don't. I, I hope you know what I'm. I'm talking about here. Well, yeah. Yours were ripe. They were. They were fresh. There was fruit. Whereas Chinon, which they 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 bring the most Cabernet Franc in there. They're the most exported Cabernet Franc. Uh, but yeah. it was like drinking salad. Yeah. Wow. You don't like salad, Michael. I like yeah. salad. I just don't want to drink it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Chinon has. You know, I cannot. Uh... I have good friend in Chino, so okay, we can't talk, we can't talk bad about Chino. I, I, I get it. I get no, it. No, no, I have my, you know, I have good friends over there. They, they, I said it's not great you. Chino producer, but uh, let's talk about Cap Franc and how it's, it's changed during the, the 20, 30 years past. Obviously, Cap Franc, you cannot be a lazy winemaker when you produce Cap Franc. That's for sure. You have to take some risk. Cap Franc has a very short windows where you can handpick it. It's three days. Before it's going to be green, as you said, you know, asparagus or green bean, you know, type of thing we don't like much, but you know, and if you go a little bit too late, it's going to be unbalanced, jammy, not interesting cap franc. It, it loses its frankness. Yeah, exactly. So the pyrazine, that molecule you are talking about, making the testing that green things, when you take, when you grab it on the right time when it's well wrapped, these green things become spice, become licorice, become eucalyptus, mint. Uh, you get some tobacco, English tobacco, sweet tobacco. All those type of things are much better and happening for the palate and for the worldwide people. So 
that's challenge for two things. Uh, first of all, because uh, export market are getting very important because customer wants ready to put a little bit more money and less drink less but better wine and give us all the winemaker moments to do right things. And the second thing is because we have a climate change and I don't want to say the good things, but so far uh, <laughs> it's changing, but it's, it's good for Cap Franc. So I don't want to say the good things, but again, uh, Cap Franc, when you're testing Cap Franc, those 10 past years on the best winemakers, wow, that you get, you get very elegancy, uh, 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 very delicate, very uh, ref- refined uh, spice and, 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 and red wines. Very nice food pairing. You can, you know, you, the, the Cap Franc could be also, uh, a uh, good match with uh, as as well as fish uh, one is a lifestyle style to a bigger uh, with meat and and salad or uh, so cap franc has really uh, lots of to offer and it's not finished it's just the beginning and i'm so happy that the Italian winemakers are producing cap franc and greek cap franc uh, because uh, i think uh, a cap franc is a, will be the next grape uh, <laughs> you don't believe it Xavier, if I if I if I had a dime for every time I heard that something is the next grape, <laughs> I'd be very wealthy. I think there's always- two people who think that Cabernet Franc are going to be the next grape on the planet, right? Okay, three people. We have Xavier, <laughs> we have Laura Laura Higgins of Amethyst Wine Agency who reps Xavier, yeah, and we have Allison Sloot of Cab Franc Chronicles. Oh, Correct. Yeah. Would you know Allison? Oh, sure, I know him. <laughs> well, uh, so, I know, that's great. You know, I, I don't. It's 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 like uh, you hear every every year. Well, this is the year Riesling's going to come out, or this is the year Tempranillo has its day in the sun, or Grenache is going to be the star, and they just it just never happens. As much as I want Cabernet Franc to have its day, um, you know whose day I, it is though, and always will be, is Chardonnay. No, no, it shouldn't. But that's another story. <laughs> what I what I do believe is I do believe that between the two and and really Ontario and because we have put it into an Ontario context of some sort because we are here, we are two. Uh, we're, we are by far not a major region here in Ontario. We make less than one percent of the world's wine. We are not on that stage, but we do focus on Cabernet Franc as our mainstay red. You from the Loire Valley, it, you know, you guys make a lot of wine, and it is your mainstay red. So we are following in the footsteps of some really great winemakers and a really great region. Uh, so I think, I think, and I think we're on the right track. And, and I do have a bottle from 2020 for you to taste to get your opinion. So yeah, we'll do, something, we'll do, what, what, okay, we'll get that in a, in a sir, bit. Laura, you were sorry. Laura is here pouring the wines for us. You pulled the last bottle. I want to take a look at the label because. Um, as you said in the podcast, I work in branding and marketing. I spend a, I spend more time thinking about wine labels than any journalist in this country. If you're a journalist who thinks that you spend more time talking about wine labels, by all means, send me an email. But you're wrong. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about your your logo on the top of the bottles here, the Amigo Vigneron, where you have a, a rooster and a hen yeah. walking. And then... Um, the uh, La Ferme des Fontaines, you somehow get, got a, a painting of Michael Dunn. Yeah. So you have a. Yeah, that's yes. me. Yeah. yeah. It's you, you, have a, you have a donkey with um, the planets going around its head and the, the moon it's on his chest. It's more of a Donald Trump thing, but yeah, I got it. <laughs> well, actually, there, there is almost something like. It's very, it's very French. It's got a bit of a. Like um, uh, Antoine Saint Exupery. Yeah, yeah. to this, but all right. Let's 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 go to the top. Let's talk about your your well, logo. Your logo with the chicken and the 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 well, rooster. What what like what's going on with your logo? Yeah, well, we have, we have a you know we tell the classic part of the classic line with le carteron, les gravelis, which is the label that exists since two hundred years. But I was talking about this farm uh, that we got since three generation, and in twenty nineteen when the uh, uh, vamet on nature start, we said. Let's make this place revive, revival, and uh, and not only wine. So we producing red and white, but also we have a, a fruit and vegetables, and we have you know animals. We have donkeys, but we have lots of geese walking uh, the vineyard. We have hen, 
and uh, we decide to put the label a little bit, uh, um, you know, changing, funnier, and uh, it's, it's fun. It, it's, it's really it, yeah, fun. It's it's this place is only not only a winery; it's part of the Claude Carteron family and wine. But we want to make this place very special and and talk about the farming in general, and uh, not only wine, but about animals on the farm. Uh, you know what we are growing: fruit and vegetables. And it's a place where you can stay overnight. And, and we didn't get time to, to, to see it, uh, Michael, last time. But uh, this place is a new generation, I think, of... Uh, we won't get out a little bit of too much wine and get said the wine, and, the wine is in the middle of, you know, a, a countryside with other production and other farming. And La Ferme des Fontaines, um, it's a place of freedom, I would say. So, uh, yeah, yeah, just to, again, I, I hate to keep doing this, but you bring it back to to the Ontario context. Um, when you go to a place like, and, it, and it's exactly what uh, Xavier is saying, when you go to a place like Featherstone, you walk around the back and they have chickens uh, and they have the sheep yep. and they have uh, various other things. And I remember asking uh, Louise, who's a winemaker here yep. in Ontario, well, she's, she's makes more the face, I guess. Yeah, so, but she's involved in the viticulture. She's involved, she, yeah, she's she, used, in viticulture. she uses hawks to keep the pests away from the yeah, vineyard. It's really hawk. amazing. So it's really, but you know, I asked her once. I said, "What's all the sheep and the the ducks and the the chickens?" And she goes, "I want to remind people that we are a farm. Yes, everybody gets you know wrapped up into the beauty of the vineyard and the wine and blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, we are." you know, susceptible to Mother Nature, everything that she does, and we are a farm. And when people see chickens, roosters, sheep, they think farming before they think of all that, you know, beautiful grapes. Exactly. It's, it's the base of the biodynamic. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, if you start to see a little bit of biodynamic, but right away you're talking about farm and balance. And we believe if you want a very well-balanced wine without any you know, using chemical or physical, you need to have a balanced environmental place. So tell us about this next wine that we, we have here, which is called, uh, let me just... Les get, Gravilis. Les Gravilis is a... Uh, well, it's a, You're talking about the dirt. Well, yeah, but well, it's... I brought some rocks here. Yeah, that, you're, you're, that was, you're, you're a real rock star. Like, you actually brought the vineyard yeah, with I you. I have to bring them back because my wine is not going to taste the same if I don't bring them back. This, oh, these, uh, this, this is the soil, right? You here. Know, He's going to make it. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I like to explain to people is that uh, we do Cap Franc on one village, only Cap Franc on different type of soil. And I'd like when the people taste the wine and taste the place, taste the soil. <laughs> this one is a coming from a vein of deep gravels. When I say deep, is a, uh, you know, 10 feet is going to be 60 feet deep of small gravel like that, draining, because you know, the vines doesn't like too much water on the roots and also very hot soil. That is uh, uh, certainly the plot where we harvest the first. Uh, the, uh, and, and when you test the wine uh, from Gravidis, we have another one called Le Fondi, which is the same type of soil. It makes the wine very warm as a bowl, very silky, almost sweet, but not the sweetness from the sugar, the sweetness from the touch of your palate, you know, is what is this is what you can expect from this type of terroir, soil, gravelis. And obviously to get that, uh, we, we, we have a classic uh, fermentation, uh, a maceration of two or three weeks. And then after we hedge it in a food raw for minimum 16 months. So there's like no wood influence? No, no, wood, no because the food raw is, uh, you know, uh, 45 hectoliter, which is a big size. Uh, he, he, they have, you know, seven years old. So it doesn't give any oak test, but the, the transfer, the oxygen transfer during 16 months, at least, uh, bring, uh, to the wine, uh, the oxygen it needs, uh, to round up, to be, to be very round and, and, and silky. And, and, you know, if you, it's, it's another type of Cap Franc. When you test Cap Franc, in Loire or in Saint Nicolas, first you don't test the varietal, you test the soil. And if you're very respectful of your farming, if you're very respectful of your 
uh, vinification. You're not going as a hurry, crushing, push most, the most. You go very soft. And then after you don't use any chemical or no, uh, no, uh, no physical, and then you, 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 you choose the right vessel to age your wine, you're going to test at the end the place. We're not going to make an Ontarian Cabernet Franc because we were talking about that. And I think Ontario, are, they have to find the, them way. They're going to make a wine from Ontario, the Cap Franc from Ontario, because they have to test the place. There are great ways. I test some great Cabernet Franc from Ontario. And I think, you know, just the beginning, but the climate is not the same. Uh, you have here a continental climate. Uh, we have more, um, you know, uh, Atlantic Ocean influence. Uh, no way, it's not going to be the same, Cap Franc. We don't, I would say to my friend winemakers in Ontario, don't try to make a Loire style Cap Franc or a Burgundy, blah, blah, blah. Make yours. Try to make the best of the place. That when you get in, it's, it's wonderful. And to do that, it would take some generation. It's empiric. <laughs> it, it, it will, because I was thinking when he was talking oh. about how old uh, San Nicolas de Bourgogne is, as far as a, a, a village being 200 years old, uh, like we're not even 200 years old. As a I, I, I love the call to action, though. Like the, the thing where it's just like, stop trying to make wine, or don't try to make wines that taste like somewhere else, make them taste like where they come from, which I think is, it's a challenge. I, I think it's just like a problem that we have in Ontario, is that people in Ontario have a bad perception of it, so... We're trying to ride on the coattails of somewhere else. So it's a, it's a tough ask that you have. But I think the other thing that you're saying is it takes patience. It's taken, like France has been around for a long time and yeah, wine has been a part a of the culture time. for a long time. And, yeah. you know, not everyone, okay, fine, maybe we're not going to be New Zealand or Oregon. It might take some time for us to figure out what we're doing. But, you know, I, I do believe that we were, we were trying to uh, be the Loire Valley for, for quite a bit of time especially in the uh, the 90s and maybe into the early 2000s when we were trying we were looking for that pyrazine note in those um in those cabernet franc and we we learned over time to get harness it harness it yeah. let them ripen a little longer let them hang a little longer wait for that 3 day window that oh, was 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 talking about so so okay so you and I need to talk to each other for a quick minute here while we're focused here like gravelis uh, you talked about the the silky and almost like sweet fruit texture. Yeah, I definitely got that. the The wine was beautifully ripe. The where the pyrazine notes in a lot of Ontario Cabernet Franc tends to stick out like a sore thumb and hit the middle of the palate on the way out. It's almost like the savory notes of your Cabernet Franc. It's like enveloped in in red fruit, so like it's there, but it's under it. It was really easy drinking. Um, did you look at the alcohol on the bottle? Did you care? Of the which the the, the, the release, uh, it, I'm gonna go f- 14, 12 and a half. Wow, okay, that's why I thought you were being very excited about it. But uh, no, I love it when the alcohol is the, low on wines because you can drink more of them. And I smoke briskets in the summer. I I'm love Cabernet s- Franc with with and, a beautiful and, piece of and smoked I'm, meat. And I'm happy to see. Tw- I, I thought we were you we were gonna go. My God, you should see what it was 14 because it was hidden very well. So I'm glad to see that no, it was, it's there was beautiful 12. balance. You know, must uh, you know. Alcohol is, is a, a big issue in the world today in a wine. Uh, most of my colleagues, especially in the south of France, in the southern hemisphere, want to stay away from, you know, 14, 15, 16 sometime. And try. In Loire Valley, we're still okay. Uh, obviously here, my, some of my colleagues get some higher alcohol content, but when you keep year-round natural grass in your uh, vineyard, you, and, and you have a very high canopy, your high color doesn't go high. My next, for instance, if I have a colleague, a grower next to me with a short canopy and a more heavy uh, 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 production on this vineyard, he will get for sure one degree more. But by the winemaking process, could not looking for to load your vines with lots of fruits and to have a high canopy and fully grass under your vines, your alcohol is just perfectly balanced. And, you know, it's, uh, it's what we're looking for. The people looking for more and more freshness 
And as you said, you know, you can drink more and, uh, and it's not warm up your palate. It just, uh, uh, carry on. The acidity is the most important, I think, uh, element in a wine to carry on after test, a long after test to help to the food pairing and to help aging your wine. Non alcohol, especially not for us. We believe we are 47 degrees north. Hey, I'll tell you, that's, that's it's, five it's degrees a, north of uh, of uh, Lake Erie North Shore, North Forty Two. Yeah, yeah, we are higher to the pole, that, closer to the pole than you. Yeah. yeah what? Uh, what's the, uh, Toronto? Is not forty seven. It's no, 40, it's like forty three. Forty three, yeah. exactly. And and so so it's it's um, so we're not afraid about alcohol. It's not a, it's not a, no. Your acidity, okay, so, your acidities are great, and and this this yeah. Let's keep this moving. So now we have another wine. This is we we're not supposed to get this wine, but oh, so that's why you had made me sneakily refill your glass. Correct. And so, Laura's not in the room, so correct. She, so we were not supposed to get that. this wine, but at some point she made a motion that because she had the the bottle in her hand and she went, you know, this is the entry level. This is the and then this is this is this is the, the top. top tier. And I'm like, you know, open this damn thing. Let's okay, try this. Before wine. we get this, so, like, grab a lease. Yeah. If I come and visit you at your estate, how much do you sell that for? And uh, for the public price? Yeah, the public yeah. price. If I come as a tourist to visit you, oh, it's going to be. Uh, I'm not sure. You it's never ask the winemaker how much a, uh, yeah, a bottle I'm is. Not, they would, never know. I would say somewhere around uh, sixteen or seventeen the, euro, euro. Euro. Yeah. Yeah. There's somebody at the winery going. Xavier, no, it's not even close to that. So, yeah. you know, just. Can Le Vaux, Le Vaux Renew. Le Vaux, so, so we, have, Hink, Le we have Le Vaux Renew. So, Vaux is veal. That's. Vaux, Vaux is. No, no. No, 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 not no, in this case. Vaux, Vaux uh, Ville is V. V E A U. La, okay. In this case, yeah. is V. V A U. Vaux means, it's an old French talking. It means a small valley. Small valley. You know, uh, well, you know the Loire Valley, obviously, go. East to west, and you have some smaller valley going no, up north to uh, south to north. But by chance, this valley is closed up north; is not totally uh, open, and 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 the cold wind uh, from the north cannot get in. So it we get there uh, a unique uh, climate, a microclimate, and is on the hill is where we have the cave. Uh, you know that's a picture, Michael. You know this. We're gonna, yeah, yeah, we're, so we're, we're, we're seeing a photo picture. of uh, we're seeing a photo of uh, the cave the where the wines are made. Yeah, right. yeah. And and uh, and uh, to compare to the, the the previous one, which is on the terrace, it's 500 meters away up uh, to the to the hill. And here, no more gravels. But we are ta- talking about limestone, pure limestone, just above the cave, and. Uh, 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 on top of the hill, just below the forest, we get uh, green clay and silex. And those two types of soil is maybe 100 yards away apart, but the, one, the, the hand pick time is not the same. It's, we have somewhere around seven days. So we cannot wait from each other, each other to, to, to hand pick them and to make the vinification of the clay and the limestone. So what we do, we Make the harvest of the limestone first. We make infusion. And then one week later, we go back in this Voronu area or up top to the hill to get the harvest of the green clay fruits. And we make infusion. And during, uh, you know, most of the time, four or five weeks infusion, we push down by hand to extract it. Uh, then after four or five weeks, we free run the clay and the limestone wine with no pump. We let them get homogeneous during three weeks. And then we fill up amphoras, which are right under the vineyard in the cave. And we hedged it for another minimum 30 months to 60 to 36 months in this amphoras. So you are testing another Cap Franc from the same village, San Nicolas de Bourgueil. But from another place, on top of the hill, it's obviously another vintage we didn't test yet today. It's 2017, which is, um, I will say, uh, 2017 is a very classic Loire style. In 2017, for us, we didn't get a very hot summer and heavy. 
and it very, is a very Loire style, very delicate, very, very uh, refined. You can see after four years, this one is still so young. Young, it, it, fresh, it, you fruity. Can, it's, yeah. it's an absolute, uh, Andre, I don't know about you, but I think this, this wine to me, uh, is, is the, is the best of the of the bunch that we have tried. Obviously, it is the top tier of the wines, um, but it really shows a real purity of of fruit. Yeah, it's um, and, and you know what I find fascinating as well is um, I, I know we haven't really been, we don't really talk about natural wine a lot on the podcast, but I think we've identified often that there is a problem with I think newer world natural wine where that's why i asked you to double down xavier about uh what you would do in a tough vintage i think those are important questions but you have a lot of people who are doing dogmatic winemaking where they're following the rules because the rules say the rules and they don't care as much about what the wines taste like it's very clear you care a lot about what your wines taste like um the cabernet franc the vogue new that we just tasted is without a doubt one of the best cabernet francs i've ever had Thank and you. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you. It, it is a lovely wine, and, and it's one of the wines that uh, we had tasted while we were we were in the Loire Valley. And, and it's it's one of those ones that made me go, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, you ha- you we did taste that wine, and um, in my corner of the table, we we finished off a couple bottles. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I, okay. I have a question about um, amphoras. Uh, yeah. How long have you been using amphoras at the winery? Well, now we have an experience of uh, eight years, close to ten years. Uh, ten years now. At first, you know, ten years ago, we were talking about amphoras. We said, you know, is that something new? It's a marketing, blah blah blah. We're going to put that on the labels. No, no, yeah. it's not us. But uh, I, I bought a couple of uh, amph- um, amphoras and make the try. And now after eight vintage, and now we have, I think, 30. We got um, 15 more since we grew oh, them. <laughs> so we have uh, around 30 or 35 uh, amphoras now. I can say that's the perfect content to age a wine. It's not a new content. It was the first content. You know, yeah. it exists since 8,000 8, years. But the thing is, you know, when you make, when you winemaker, you want to make the best wine from that place, do you want to make all your heart in it? Uh, you don't want to add in any oak, any uh, exogen. I don't know oxygen, a type yeah. of te- uh, you you, you uh, uh, exogen. Uh, oh. You know, add test. You know, oak okay. test. You know, if you can make as pure oh. as pure as possible, only fruits, only acidity, only bitterness, like bitterness, only things, and it makes perfect. That's great, and is what I want to accomplish today. If uh, I don't want to say I'm going to stay away from any kind of oak barrels and everything, because obviously it's a great this uh, continent to age a wine. But when you do natural wine, you don't use any chemical uh, or no twist to make your wine. Uh, why shouldn't put that in a clear uh, content with not giving any test, a specific test add in? Uh, so it's com- it's pretty complicated. We're still learning about it because you have different um, dirt, terracotta. You have the the, the low cook one, uh, less than one thousand degrees Celsius cook, which is a clay pot with lots of uh, oxygen transfer, and and you have another one called more go- going to ceramic with less transfer oxygen, a cook. The the, 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 the the amphora are cooked over 1,000 degrees Celsius with very low transfer. So obviously, from what you are testing at first, you choose the right content. Sometimes you said, oh, this wine, I can see it in this type of content. And sometimes uh, you choose... Your, so if you come to see my cave, you will see all type of amphora, uh, all type of size and form because the form is so important uh, just a quick thing maybe it's techniques but I think it's important if your amphora is totally round as a ball you know the way the pressure is going to make a pressure on your liquid in the wine and it's going to make your wine in movement and you're going to have a natural batonnage okay yeah. it's round if you take an amphora almost as a tube yeah the, 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 the flow is going to be much slower 
and, 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 and you're going to get less least contact, enfin, less movement, less... Uh, well, on a gentral but, extraction of everything, uh, when you use amphora, do you put the the full fruit in it as well? No, just, say just the juice? Just okay. the juice, because my cave is 13 degrees Celsius. It's too cold to make the alcoholic fermentation in it. Gotcha. But it's good enough to make malolactic fermentation into aging. Cool. So, uh, I want to say that each amphora has a very specific and unique uh, 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 a way to uh, uh, refine your, the aging of the wine. And again, it's natural and, and you cannot, from an amphora to another one, you have to learn from that. It's empiric. You have to learn from a vintage to another vintage. Every year, we do 45 single cuvées of Cabernet Franc Saint Nicolas at first, plot by plot. And after 18 months, we're going to finish with only eight. That means every week we are testing the wine with my brother and my team, blend eyes, and we say, oh, we got it. This week we got it. The number three and number four, you know, number eight, let's put them together in this type of content. And let's, and every year the itinerary is different. We, you, you see what I mean? You, you do by feeling. You do by people around the table testing with you. And uh, each content is so different. Amphora are not stainless steel. If you take two vat of stainless steel 10 hectoliters ago, your wine is going to test pretty the much. If you take two amphoras from the same uh, amphora producer, 10 hectoliters, if they are not going to test the same. So you have to know each of, each of them. So that's the part of the, the great part of the winemaker uh, is testing the wine and decide the aging away of the wine if someone had told me in january of 2023 that some of my favorite wines of this year were going to be from a natural winemaker that michael pincus was going to introduce me to <laughs> i would have lost a bet because it's actually something michael and i have said on the podcast many times is that one of the problems with the natural wine movement like i said is dogmatic winemaking is that there's a lot of snake oil salesmen who are happy to sell faulted wines and say it's part of the process where um, I think you might be my new favorite winemaker from the Loire because the other winemaker I fell in love with were Catherine and Pierre Breton. Hmm. And I did not know that they were natural winemakers because the wines were good. I have Nuit d'Ivresse. I keep that in my house at all times. I have magnums of it in my house because I like to have it on hand because it's a delicious wine. What you've presented to us today are delicious wines. I think it's amazing that you're trying to do natural winemaking, but it's a it's a byproduct. You're like it's great that you're doing that, but the wines are delicious, and that's the most important thing. So we're um, we're going to wrap this thing up. Yeah, we obviously, are. Uh, what uh, what we've done now is poured um, uh, Xavier, a wine from Vineland. It is their uh, let's call it their base model. We've just gone from a top tier. Loire wine to the entry level from Vineland. It's holding up really well. I, I think well. it's holding up, but I want to hear what uh, Xavier has yeah, to Xavier, say. what do you think? And uh, the other thing I, I, I do want to say while Xavier is tasting this wine is that uh, it's not every day, Andre, that in, in 2023 you get invited back to a man's cave. I'm just saying. It just doesn't happen very often. So uh, Xavier has invited us very nicely back to his cave. He's not pulling us by the hair, so I'm very oh, happy I'll, about that. I'll be there. I'll be so, there. So, Xavier, this is uh, from the 2020 Vintage, which is you know, one of the better vintages that Ontario has seen. Um, obviously, under screw cap, which I don't know how much uh, Loire Valley goes under screw cap these days. Um, oh, you are, you are, you're like, you're, you're not just like shaking your head like, you don't like screw caps. It's not I'm not like screw cap, but why using screw cap when you have a good cork? I understand the early 2000 when the, when the cork uh, industry was uh, asking too much to the, to the cork, uh, cork. Uh, uh, but in, in the, the cork was so bad and, and New Zealand and give uh, the way to all the wine industry to go to screw cap. But today I think the, 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 the oak, the, the cork, Industry is very careful about the forest of oak, and we got a great cork. 
So when uh, every day you're working in your vineyard, making as uh, clean as possible, as healthy your vineyard and your soil, and you make your winemaking as not using anything, you won't keep natural up to the hand. And cork today, it costs most, maybe it's more money, a good cork, but you know, you don't care. You want your wine taste good five, 10 years, 15 years ago. On the road. I, I am gonna, I'm going to defend Brian Schmidt a little bit here. He did not, I, I know he, he came to screw cap kind of kicking and screaming a little bit. I know he wasn't that thrilled about doing it, but he realized that, that, that this wine, uh, required I, I, like the, I, like the opi- I like the opinions on it. So, uh, it's a battle I have even with my little wine company. Like, I like, I like screw caps for the cost and the consistency that I know every bottle of when pigs fly rose I sell. Because it's a wine I want drunk young, sure. will be of a consistent quality. Yeah. I know Adam. Adam has started his own kerning company. That's the winemaker who made the wonderful testimony that we tasted. He spends a lot of money on good corks mm. for his project there, and I don't know if the ADX wine company is ever going to spend a lot of money on corks because we we're trying to keep our costs down. It's expensive to buy good corks. So now, well, so I do. I do want to find out what Xavier thinks. Cork screw cap don't. Don't look over here. No, look that, back into the glass. Yeah, let's talk yeah. about the wine. Let's talk about the wine. You, what did you think about this um, Cabernet Franc? Well, uh, 2020, you said it's a good vintage. It's a good you? vintage. Well, it's hot, 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 dry. Dry, but enough balance horrible, to hold the city. Horrible for human beings. Good for good okay. for, But, but well, we, had, we, had, we had cool nights, which we don't usually have in hot summers, so I'm not, there I'm should not, be okay. some acid. I'm not okay. talk, I don't want to talk him in or out yeah, of this I'm wine. I want to hear what he says. It seems to be the same than we got in 2020 in Loire Valley, in French in general. It's a great, it's a good vintage. Is in Loire Valley, and I'm not sure here, but I didn't taste many vintages from this same cuvee, but I will say it's a little bit, this type of vintage are a little bit demonstrating because you get a little bit more sun yes. and uh, um, astral, as we say, more than we you got from the, from the soil, from the earth, yep. you know? So, I love this one. It's very well made. It's fresh. Screw cap is fine with me. Don't 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 get me wrong. <laughs> if you if you're going to test it in the next uh, two or three years, that's perfect. Obviously, I don't think screw cap it would be great if this wine is made to be uh, drink in five years. But uh, this cap franc, you can. When I smell it, I got the cap franc. Nothing wrong. It's not the Cap Franc from Laurelet, I'm sure. I'm, <laughs> no. it's, you don't mess up, but it's different. Keep going, making your own Cap Franc here with your own, you know, identity is what we love. It's what the customer wants. You want to be proud of your Cap Franc. Don't try to make it as we do because we don't have the same climate again. But this one is excellent. And I will be very interesting to hide the bottle of 2020. This Cap Franc in the middle of a testing of Loire Cap Franc 2020 and say what's going to say my colleagues, winemakers, and, and I will be surprised. You, that, that's, a, that, that's a pretty high compliment. That's a high compliment, yeah, Brian. I, you should I, be very I like happy. It. Yeah, no, you, you know, I really enjoy it. The only thing is, again, 2020 is a little bit demonstrative and crushed by sun Correct. and hide a little bit the soul expression. That's... but. To the sales point and commercial point, it's perfect. <laughs> All right, so so Xavier, uh, last question before we wrap: Which Ontario Cabernet Franc did you like better? I oh, know the first one or the second one. Ah, oh yeah, oh the the 2011 on the, on oh, the this 2020. one. 2020. Yeah. Wow, it's a war. It's <laughs> oh, don't tell me you're going to be a politician here. No, well, you know, I know where he's I, going. I, I prefer, I know. Uh, uh, you know, sincerely. But, you know, my, my, my point of view is... He has his not, hand on the testimony, by the way. It's, it's a 2021. The, the 2011 is, is uh, you know, it's, it's my grandma spelling. You know what I'm saying? It's because he, it's he my, likes, he likes yeah. them a little bit green, and he likes them a little bit reedy, yeah. and he likes them yeah. a little weedy. Yeah. That's what he likes. He doesn't yeah. like that that fruit. I could feel where he was going with I that. I like it too. But, you know, <laughs> each, each one at this time of the day. Tonight is like that. Let's talk tomorrow with another wine. <laughs> it could be, it could be, it could be completely different. Do you know what, uh, Xavier, I just, I'll just tell you, so 
Uh, you know, it's 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 weird. We 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 poured this wine after your high end. This is this is holding this is really well. this is Brian's entry level fifteen dollar Cabernet Franc. Good so job. it's it's um, it, okay. it you know standing next to your your high end. It was yeah. kind of a, a not a fair comparison to Brian, but I think no. it did hold up, and it was it was uh, it, but it was good. really so, good. So, so, so Michael, no, sixteen dollars. Sorry, it's fifteen ninety five now. I think. So oh, and the uh, the other one was how long? How much? Sixty dollars. So sixty euros or sixty dollars in Canada. So that uh, le le vo uh, le vo renew is sixty dollars. Xavier, thank you very very much for the um, the inspiration. I think what you're saying to Ontario, telling us to do our own thing, is something that we really need to hear from people outside our borders because. It is a problem here that Ontarians don't drink Ontario wine, but we've had you say very nice things about two Cabernet Francs here, which yeah. I also think is important. So I, I hope you don't mind us springing that on you. Oh, no. Thank you very much for sharing your excellent wines. I'm looking forward to talking to Laura about putting an order together yeah. uh, and getting my hands on some of these because, um, like, wow. And, and Michael, like, we haven't had a chance to travel together, but this is a real treat. So thank Laura. Xavier, Michael, thank you for putting this together. Uh, Xavier, it was a pleasure seeing you again, and uh, I hope we, uh, uh, we, we, Andre and I, can get out to your caves because you just don't get invited to everybody's cave every moment. All right, so this is our <laughs> first is podcast of uh, 2024. Happy New Year, Michael. Happy New Year, Xavier. Thank you. Happy New Year, Laura. I think we'll have to get our hands on a Galat des Rois. It's a French tradition that doesn't really uh, make it here in Canada, but you, you're going to love it, Michael. I'm in. <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm in. So it doesn't require uh, me. Uh, it, it doesn't require me to take my clothes off, right? No, it requires you to eat. Oh, then I'm in. I'm in. Okay. And, and and if you get the the magic bean that's hidden in the cake, it means you're the king for the night. And do I get get to go to a? Oh cave? my god, he's never had a galette de rois. Can you believe that? Oh, no, no. I've never had it, but I've, do, do I get to go to your cave? Is that my? Uh... Okay, we're going to his cave. We get that. All right, got okay. it. Support the podcast. patreoncom slash two guys talking wine. Uh, Andre Wine Review at Andre Wine Review on social media. AndreWineReview.ca is my website. Um, our sponsorship with Valdaca is over, so we're looking for new sponsors. So by all means, if you have a few dollars, we're not expensive to sponsor, but uh, we appreciate the support that helps us keep things going. And I'm Michael Pingus of MichaelPinkusWineReview.com. Again, a big thank you to Laura, a, an even bigger thank you to Xavier, who's traveled up just a little bit further. And um, I, uh, I am on social media as the Grape Guy. Andre, thank you for actually liking one of the winemakers I brought to town. I didn't actually have anything to do no, with it. No, this, this was he amazing. He just came on his own steam. Um, and good night. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to Two Guys Talking Wine on iTunes. Two Guys Talking Wine is produced by Jim Ray, Adam Duran, and Ken Little.